Good evening, everyone. We are honored to have all of you here tonight. At the Framingham History Center, our goal is to create and connect community through the exploration of Framingham's past, present, and future. Raise your hand if you have visited the Framingham History Center before. All right, a few. Raise your hand if you have not visited the Framingham History Center before. And there's no shame, no shame. So. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we have some old friends and we also have some new friends here tonight. Um, the Framingham History Center is located on the Center Common in Framingham and we have three historic buildings. We have public programs like this one. We have a 10,000 piece artifact collection that we would love to have you come and explore. And we also have exhibitions. And one of the reasons we're here tonight is to start conversations in anticipation of our next exhibition, which is called Collective Journeys, Framingham's Global Migration Story, 1960 to Present. The exhibition will open this fall, and it will feature stories of immigration to Framingham in the last few decades. And so as a part of that, the most important component are stories told directly by people who have immigrated to Framingham. So tonight, you'll hear from four people who immigrated to Framingham over the years, and we are so grateful to them for sharing their stories with us. And this is just what history is. History is full of stories that we share with each other. Some of these stories stretch back generations, and some of the stories just happened today. The story of Framingham goes back thousands of years, and it includes the history of indigenous peoples who have cared for this land and who continue to be a part of the present and the future of this region. The story of Framingham is, in many ways, also a story of refugees and immigrants. Some of you may have heard about Sarah Clay's escaping the Salem witch trials to settle in Framingham. Others of you might have heard of the Irish, Italian, and Jewish immigrants who have helped build the industry, the government, the religious life, and the social life of Framingham since the 1800s. The vibrant immigration history of Framingham continues today, where nearly one-third of Framingham residents were born outside the United States, and many more are children of immigrants. So it is so important for us to explore preserve and share the unfolding story of immigration in our community. At the Framingham History Center, we explore and tell these histories and stories of Framingham. So whether your family has lived here for generations upon generations, or whether you just moved here a few weeks ago, this means that your story is important to the history of Framingham. But when we tell stories, we realize they're sometimes hard to tell. So often in our busy lives, we're full of work, we're full of school, we're full of visits to the grocery stores, and reflecting and thinking about the past is often the last thing that's on our minds. And yet reflecting on the past, whether it's a day ago or a year ago, helps us to understand ourselves and understand our history. And then when we share these stories with each other, we create ties to each other. And these ties, in turn, create community and a sense of belonging. And so tonight, with all of you here, with all of us together, it's a rare opportunity in our busy, busy lives to stop and to reflect. It's an opportunity for us to hear stories and perhaps to tell some stories of our own. And I hope, through these conversations, that we create a sense of belonging with each other and belonging to each other. So this evening, you will hear three sets of conversations led by our moderator, whom I will introduce in just a moment, that will then be followed by a group conversation and a Q&A. But before I move on to our speakers, I have to express deep gratitude. Um, we are an independent nonprofit, and we could not host programs like this without our extraordinary sets of partners, including the Framingham Public Library, which thank you, and let's all give them a round of applause. the Framingham Public Library, um, who provided the space for us, the Framingham Adult ESL Program, where I know many of you are coming from tonight, and Jewish Family Service as well. So thank you to all of our partners. Additionally, we could not host tonight without the support of Mass Humanities, who have very generously sponsored this program and our Collective Journeys exhibitions through their Expand Massachusetts Stories grant. So now it is my honor to introduce the moderator and the speakers for tonight.
Again, that third hand would be great. <laughs> so our moderator for this evening is Lino Kovarubias, who is the CEO of Jewish Family Service Metro West. JFS, um, Jewish Family Service, is a community-based nonprofit organization serving over 7,000 individuals and families annually within Metro West and greater Boston regions. They support vulnerable children and families, individuals, immigrants, and elders aging in place. Lino is a first-generation Mexican-American, having been, having been born and raised in Southern California's migrant agriculture region of the Imperial Valley. Under Lino's leadership in the last 14 years, JFS has accelerated reducing social, academic, and health inequity in community members experience financial distress, poverty, racism, and anti-Semitism, especially families with young children and frail, isolated older adults. Lino is passionate about identifying families that have been left behind and providing that needed safety net to allow families to be able to be stable and thrive. And I can personally attest to that passion through our conversations together. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he is especially proud of JFS's work keeping immig immigrant families from being homeless and providing basic needs to them and helping older adults in the Jewish community stay safe and connected. Individuals served during the peak of the pandemic um, provided over, excuse me, JFS during the pandemic provided over 90,000 meals and over 120,000 units of toiletries and sanitary products, learning material for, ch for children and information and multi-languages to the community. So as you can see, both Lino and the JFS are a treasure in our community and in our region. Lino will be hosting um, some conversations with our guest speakers here tonight. And we are joined by Yad and Hanan Bayad, who live in Framingham with their two children, who are wonderful and delightful, and I think in the library right now. Originally from Damascus, Syria, they left in September of 2012 in search of safety for their family and refuge from the violent civil war. They first went to Jordan, where they registered with the United Nations High Council for Refugees and waited for four years before finally boarding a flight for the United States in November 2016. JFS of Metro West, along with community members, welcomed the family to Framingham and supported them while they built a new life here. Their daughter attends Blocks Preschool, and their son is in middle school at Fuller. Ayad is working for a construction company, and Hanan is studying for her GED. On April 29th, 2022, they became U.S. citizens. We're also joined by Jen Grietchi. Jen is a passionate advocate for immigrant students, as she herself immigrated from Italy in 1970. Jen worked with Framingham Public Schools as the Director of Multilingual Education Programs for 40 years and retired in 2021, which we put retired in quotation marks because I know she's doing extraordinary work and continues to do so. Under her leadership, the Office of Multilingual Education doubled down on dual language education, expanding the number of its schools with the program from one to four of nine. Now we're also joined by Liliani Costa, which I know many of you know here tonight. So Liliani has served as the executive director of the Brazilian American Center, or BRACE, in Framingham, where she works tirelessly. In fact, she just came here after just finishing work this evening, um, where Liliani works tirelessly to promote the access of education, mental health, sports, and arts for the Brazilian and Latin American communities in the Metro West area. Liliani works hard in creating new collaborative relationships in the area to welcome and empower all migrants in their process of integration and adaptation in the host communities. So as you can see, you're in for a real treat tonight. So we'll have these conversations, um, and then Lena will bring up the group as a whole, and then we'll open up to Q&A. And then at the, the very end, when we conclude our formal program, we have an opportunity for you to add your voice to the exhibition um, that will be opening at uh, um, the Framingham History Center. So now it is my honor to turn it over to Lino. Great, thank you, Anna. <clears throat> Anna, next time you should get one of these mics. You don't need to, okay. Um, before I start and invite our first guest up, I just wanna say how honored I, was at, I, I am to be asked to do, to be the moderator today. Uh, first, because I am a first generation uh, son of immigrants from, from Mexico. ¿Cuántos mexicanos tenemos aquí? A ver, uno, dos, tres. 
Cuatro. I saw a bunch of little Mexican pins up on the map. Um, and secondly, you know, as Anna mentioned, I was personally involved with the resettlement of Hanan and Iyad and his family, which was an amazing experience for me. I get a little choked up when I think about their arrival. But uh, thank you for coming. And I think what I want to say, and what Anna asked me, is I think uh, when we think about history, you know, a lot of times we think about history being the past. But what do we learn from it? And how we apply it to today? Because I think what you're going to find out today, every, every immigrant story will have a common thread. And I think the common thread will be that the community stood up and helped them. And we've got to remember that as more immigrants come into our community, that it's really up to us to really stand up and assist. So without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Hanan and Ida to come up here. I think they're on this side. Or it doesn't matter, whatever side you want. <coughs> And I've got a few questions. I think uh, some of the questions are really going to lead to just that common thread I, I talked about of you know the initial experience. So thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm so excited to have both of you, and you said yes. Um, and can you just talk about your initial experience? You know, you you were refugees from the Ref United Nations Refugee on the High Commission on Refugees and you were finally able to come to America. You could, have come, you could have gone to Canada, you could have gone to Holland, but you came to America. Uh, and one thing to note with refugees, it's not your choice. You don't choose, I want to come to America, I want to Canada. It's, you're on the, on the, on the order of, of, of being a refugee, you get picked and that's where you go. That's, most people don't know that, that it's not your option. But first of all, what was it like? to come to this new land, to America. Tell us about your initial experience. It's on. <laughs> First, when we came to the United States, uh, it, everything difficult, it's, it's a new life. We worried about everything in the United States uh, because we lived in Jordan about four and a half years. It's not life. I tell you a true, it's not life. Because also people say, you know, this is a refugee people. When we came to the United States, the last airport we rode, we cried. It's a new life. We didn't know anything about our life here. When we say first Lino and also Arabic women, she wore a hijab. She gave me a hug. Hanan, welcome in the United States. You know, I saw my life in the United States. It's so easy. It's everything beautiful. Just because I saw a woman wear a hijab and she gave me a hug, Lino and uh, also another people say, welcome in the United States. Everything I, I think it about, it's done. I think now about a new life. Everything... I, I don't know anything, but now, now, I'm right in the right way. Everything good, health, people. When we came here, the people said, welcome. When we rode to, be, uh, to take uh, my kids to the bus, they say, smile, welcome. This happened. It's nothing in in our country or in Jordan. Just say, "Oh, refugees, go back to our to your country." But here, really, we love the love here, and we love the people. Just when see the people smile in your face, oh, everything good here. <laughs> now, something uh, you know, it's a question for you, Iyad. Uh, Iyad came here. Uh, you know, he had, you know, suffered some uh, injuries uh, in the war in Syria. Um, can you tell us about that experience? Because I so clearly remember when you first got here, and, and the very first thing we wanted to do is really give you care, medical care. Um, I was um, broken my, my body, all, all my body. I, um, in Jordan, I, I stay in my bed. Uh, like uh, six months, I I can't move anywhere. 
when I move, I work for five dollars in um, pharmacy, like uh, for just one day. I my rent home is five fifty uh, GD, like uh, dinar two hundred dollars, like two hundred dollars. Um, I work for about five dollars in one day, every day, every day. But I can't work more. Um, after five years, as the United um, United States, when I came in to the United States, um, direct to hospital next day or next one week to Boston Hospital, um, they uh, give me all all um, I don't know in Shubna no spelling she speak more than me English I don't know you're good doing good you're doing good yeah uh, very good um, care of us um, uh, every every doctor um, look at me to my body where is have any problem and uh, they um, um, everything is very good right now but I have any, uh, a little bit but everything is uh, going go good um, and we we, we uh, think about uh, when we come here is the Jewish family services help us very very uh, good help and we think about other people as they stay in uh, our our country or uh, near my uh, all all state near my country. Yeah. And this it was good. Thank you. And one of the things I I remember so clearly, uh, but yeah, the the doctors would say, "How is it possible you you must have a lot of pain?" And Ied would say. Everybody has pain because, you know, in Jordan and Syria, there's, you don't get painkillers when you're hurt. And, and the doctors were like, it's amazing. This, this, this guy is so resilient. He can do anything. Uh, and, and I think that was one of my big takeaways always that when immigrants do come to, to America, they're so resilient. Um, and my next question is going to be about your children because I remember Mohammed when he, at the airport, Muhammad was, what was he, five years or six years old? Uh, five and a half, and he spoke only Arabic. And he was able to really like, assimilate and become part of the community. Can you talk about your children, how they have, what the immigrant story has been with them, their, 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 their travels with, within the community? Uh, when we came, Muhammad, he has five years old. When we rode the airport, uh, he is sleeping all the time, not sleeping, but he has a coma with the iron ball. Uh, when we came here, he just tired because probably 24 hour, uh, because we take probably three to four iron board to come to the United States. Um, probably next two days when we came here, we took Mohammed to Framingham Public School to take a test if he know anything about English. And uh, he go to Brophy Elementary School. Um, yeah. And he quickly adapted. Yeah, he, he is very quick uh, damaged with another kid. Uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult the first year probably and the second year because he didn't understand anything. He to they talk um, around him. Uh, he didn't have anything to talk with his friend he came to home he cried i didn't understand um, but now he spoke english when when you talk with him you say this is not arabian people this is an american people he speak a lot of english yeah thank you um and then we have a couple more minutes because we have 10 minutes and then we'll talk as, as a group uh what do you think was the most important thing for you uh, that's made you successful, that you think, when you think about what's the most important thing that, as an immigrant that came here, really helped me? Um, I think 
nothing more than you do it for us. You do a lot of a lot of things, everything to to the family when we came uh, refugees for my family for another family. You do a lot. I think nothing can do it to come up best. You are the best right now. And and I what we had for the Syrian humanitarian project, we had a whole community response. We had volunteers, we had faith leaders. It was an entire community that responded uh, to help them because you just can't do it alone. An organization can't do it alone. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things that we continue to to learn with with, with uh, immigrants that come here, that it really takes a community to make it successful. And, and you're a really good example of that. Yeah, when we came, um... No volunteers the first three months. Just this woman I told you about her, Nermin Hilali. She she do hard so much for me. She bring me to every appointment, doctor appointment, to government, any any appointment. And um, they help us a lot. And right now we are a family with the Jewish Family Service. Not, just they are bring us to the United States. No, right now we are a family. They, we are text us uh, probably every couple months, but we know a lot of everything about us. And then Hermine Hilali was a, uh, she was a culturally appropriate person that we hired that spoke Arabic. She was Egyptian and also was, was a woman that wore, wore a hijab. And I think that when the, she first saw that at the airport, made you feel comfortable that it was just, wasn't so such a strange land after all. Great. Thank you. All right. You guys can have a seat. Come up, Jen. And, and now as we kind of, you know, um, with Hanan and Iyad, there, had, there were just arrived in 2017. Jen, you, you've been here since 1970. Yes, so, a long time ago. So you have a lot of experience as somebody who came here as an immigrant from Italy. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I will definitely ask you the same questions, but then more so because you've been here much longer. What was it like when you got here? And you were 12 years old, I believe, so, when you first got here. Yeah, so when we came, I was 12 years old, and there were nine people that came um, at the, the, our family. So along with my parents, uh, there, my brother was eight years old, and my sister was three months old. Uh, my grandmother also came, and an aunt and an uncle also came. So it really was um, the dream of my father to be reunited with his brother, uh, who had been here since the 1950s. Um, we waited um, in, we, in those days, we, there was a, a quota of Southern um, Europeans, and so we waited for eight years before we were able to get the okay uh, to come. And my uncle sponsored all nine of us. And as a sponsor, uh, he had just recently arrived less than 10 years before, but as a sponsor, he was responsible for finding us a job for, you know, uh, for um, you know, uh, making sure that we were in school, uh, taking us to our appointments. Remember, in, the, in 1970, there was no Jewish family services. There was no brace. Um, it, it was very much a community, you know, family uh, building. We had an uncle who was able to, um, you know, to uh, find us places to live and food on the table. And um, we were really extremely fortunate, not only that our family was able to finally be reunited, but also that my uncle had really um, taken the responsibility of finding uh, jobs for my father, of making sure that we were, you know, in um, you know, in in an apartment um, that that we needed, that we had everything that we needed. Um, and but my story really is the story of a young girl who um, shows up at school one morning, um, and there are teachers who really don't know what to do with this young girl who, uh, in Italy, I was a very um, 
I was a very um, interested in uh, learning, in literature, in um, you know, in everything that was educationally. Uh, you know, I came here and f and I didn't know anything. I came here and uh, again, teachers really didn't know what to say. I couldn't. I couldn't communicate. Um, there was no one who spoke Italian, uh, or uh, there were no teachers. So I think the first year of my life in the 1970 to 71, basically it was my resilience and my perseverance. And I came to, uh, after the day was done at school, sitting in the back of the classroom and just uh, printing my name, over and over and over again, um, because my name changed from Genoveffa. Well, that's too hard to pronounce. Let's <laughs> call you Jennifer, right? With a J, uh, as if anyway. But um, but I think coming to uh, coming to the library, the Framingham Public Library. Uh, in those days, um, it was at the old um, Danforth Museum. Um, Really, that's when I went downstairs to the children's section and basically I learned how to read in English using um, picture books um, because, um, because that I wasn't being uh, supported in schools. Um, and so I think that that was before chapter uh, 71A, right, where you had to, um, uh, you had to really uh, support students who came from other countries. So that year really was a defining moment in my life because I said, okay, if I can get through this, you know, I'm going to change um, for other students. You know, so that they don't have to go through what I went through that first year. Um, there's a lot of other things, but yeah. I don't want to keep talking about no, myself. Very good. <laughs> no, that's that's very good. Uh, I think I like what you said. Uh, you know, I'm, we're trying to figure out common threads. Resilience is really important. Mm -hmm. um, what do you what do you say to you know new arrivals, new immigrants that arrive, based on your experience? And well, you know now you've been in the community for 30 years. You know what what. What can you provide an advice right. for, the, for, for immigrants? So Framingham has been my home since 1970. I went to college, and then I was really fortunate enough to, to be employed by Framingham Public Schools as an ESL teacher. And those of you who know me, you know I, I, I retired as the director um, and of the multilingual education program. I think for me, the, the thread all of these years has been to support students, to help students, newcomers, students who have just recently arrived, um, students who really said, well, I don't have money for a college education. Well, let's find out. The, the ESL teacher and the department and the programs that we've established in Framingham really have been um, so defining for a lot of students who have gone on to become um, to become doctors and lawyers and teachers and you know and dispatchers and they you know amazing um, and I think and I think um, you know I, I used to get a lot of uh, sort of. Uh, you know, from other colleagues saying, well, you know, you can't nurture these, these, these students are not your children. And I said, while they are under my care, these students, I will support these students and help these students the same way that I would do one of my own child, right? And I think um, I've been very fortunate and I thank my lucky stars that um, I was able to really make a difference in the lives of so many students um, over the course of, the, of my career here. As, as uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, as an educator, I have to ask you this because you've been, you were an educator for many years. Uh, can you comment about history? What, what do you think is really important about taking the history of the past and making it relevant to now? Um, it's, it's extremely important because we are, we are, we cannot move forward 
unless we know where we've come from, unless we know um, what our um, ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, you know, and what they went through. You know, and I always say that um, uh, the American dream is just that. It's an American, it, it is a dream. When you're in other countries, you think of America as the land of opportunity. You think of America as um, I can make it, you know. However, the reality is very different when you come here. And so the reality is that people have to work under very uh, extenuating circumstances. People have lost their lives building railroads or building homes. Um, unless you have a true understanding of that piece, you really cannot be so wide-eyed and say, oh, this is the land of opportunity. You need to work really, really hard. I always find that as a woman, as an immigrant, um, you know, I always had to work twice as hard to ensure that, you know, that my, uh, my advocacy for immigrant students and for immigrant families, you know, uh, was, um, um, was really, you know, um, where, you know, what I wanted, you know, um, to, um, you know, to make sure that they knew to communicate. So, um, so history is everything. Um, and so I'm so glad that this is, you know, this is really happening. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I, I remember this is something I, I, I loved so much growing up that our families were always working. I grew up, as, as Anna said, in an agricultural region in Southern California, and we were always working, seasonal crops, whatever, we were always working, and it was, that's what you did. You always worked, and it just, and, and for me, it was a really, it was a great experience because I got to learn so many things about not only the roots of my family, but also other people, why they came here, and they were, and one thing I remember clearly, they always said, I'm doing this for my children. Right. I am working very hard for my children. I, I am an immigrant, and my education level is a certain, a, a, yeah. and I know my earnings are only a certain level, but I'm working really hard for, for, yeah. for my children. And as educators, you know, especially um, throughout all of these years, we always made sure that whenever we had events, it would be at a time when our parents and our families could come to the events. So, um, so we always we always made sure that you know we would have events in in here in the costume room, um, you know, with um, translations and with the refreshments, and um, so the, at a time when parents were able to attend, you know, so the outreach to our families is is something that I'm also very proud of because. You know, from my experience, where my parents never came to, never came to my school, never spoke to my teachers. It was my ESL teacher who came to the house, the earliest home visits. Right now, it's all the rage, but the earliest home visits in 1975, the ESL teacher came to my home and told my parents, "Your daughter can and should go to college." Right, um, because that was not in sort of in my parents. They were busy working and they were busy raising a family. That's right, right. So, well, thank you. Well, so you're much. welcome. We'll have you back. Liliani, you're up. Well, I know Liliani so well. The work we've done together in the community. I know I'm no better advocate for immigrants than Brace. Thank really. You. Thank you. Um, and um, like everybody else, I start with the first question of what was it like for you when you first came to the U.S.? How old were you, by the way? And what? Um, I was 32 years old, married with four kids. The oldest was 13 and the youngest five. And... I, I can't say I have some difficulties because my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they came to U.S. in 1980. We had a family here to help us with everything. My first job was at Dunkin' Donuts, okay, uh, for one month. 
After that, I went to work with my brother-in-law at the Brazilian bakery, the, the first one who was open in downtown Framingham. Uh, today is Marão Lanches. That was the first bakery here. <laughs> Nobody likes it. <laughs> yes. Um, and we, I think uh, we as immigrants, we always come for the same reason. Everyone wants to have a better life. It, this was my goal, to give to my kids a better life. And I'm very proud of that. I did. Okay? My four kids, they are graduated from college. Everyone chose your own uh, pet. And my oldest daughter, she went to college without documentation. Okay? Uh, there is a meat on the community. Ki, uh, they say, uh, you, if you don't have uh, papers, documentation, you, your kids can't go to school. This is not true. They can go. Okay? My oldest daughter is, did that. Um, I think one and a half year before she graduated, she got the green card, okay? Uh, we came here with visitor visas, and we stayed for 25 years now. <laughs> uh, I always tell people, don't worry. Your situation can change over the time. Our changed, okay? Uh, we got the green card in 2005. In 2010, 11, we became a US citizen. Uh, everybody in my house. Uh, we don't live in Framingham uh, anymore, but we used to, and I work here. I can tell I live here for 25 years because I just go home to sleep. <laughs> Um, uh, my oldest daughter, she was, uh, Jen was her teacher, and she was the first Brazilian that the Framingham police um, hired to be a dispatcher. Dispatcher? dispatcher. Sorry. I, I trying to get there, people. <laughs> it's difficult, okay? Um, she, today she is a um, director of Nashoba Valley G Dispatcher <laughs> Association. Okay. Uh, my second daughter, she, um, she has a master's in um, health administration. My third one, she is a biochemistry. And my youngest, my baby, who will turn 30 this year, he is a restaurant owner in Marlboro. And he did, he, his studies was in Framingham uh, State University. He did uh, marketing and he loves what he does now. And he, I am a mother very, very proud of my kids, okay? When they finish the college, I think, well, what I will do now? I don't have nothing to worry me about anymore. <laughs> That's why when I start to work at the Brazil American Center, okay? Until there, I was a house cleaner. I cleaned the house for a long, long time to support my kids, okay? And after that, I didn't nothing to do anymore. 
I went to Brazil American Center and I'm trying to help people who come here. And if I can give you some advice, the immigrants in here, learn English. This can open doors for you guys. Okay, when I, my kids were are grown, growing up, I use them to translate to me all the time. Okay, I was so afraid to pick up the phone because I couldn't understand nothing at the phone. This was my nightmare over the years. I lost this a few years ago. No too much, okay? And the people who knows me from this time, like Jen, Christine, Lino, uh, until a few years ago, I couldn't be here talking to you in English <laughs> because it was so hard to me to do that, okay? But this is life. I love being here. When we came, I know I couldn't give a good life for my kids in Brazil. I came here to do that, and I did. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I, thank you, Leanne, for mentioning uh, how important languages and English because we do have Framingham ESL here. <laughs> I saw a lot of nodding, so hopefully study hard. And I think that's why we always say that uh, English is really important. You don't, lo you don't have to lose your, your native language, and it's important that your kids get that, that language as well, because it's a free language. I, I'm so glad that my parents taught us Spanish, because some of my cousins who lived in different parts of California, uh, my uncles or aunts decided not to teach Spanish in the household. And they can understand it, but they don't speak it. So I think it's when you teach your kids, you know, you're an immigrant and you can teach your kids that language, it's a free language for them. So you should do so. So, all right, you're going to stay here. We're right on time. We're going to have you all, all come up here. Um, this is a really time, uh, really, I think there's a common thread. And we, I really want to have some time for questions because I think that's really going to bring, you know, the most out of, out of our discussion today. Um, but I think uh, one of the common threads was, in fact, uh, working hard, right? I think everybody uh, talked about when you get here to America, you work hard. And even, right, everybody here, raise your hand if you have to work hard, right? Whether you're an immigrant or not, right? You got to work hard, right? We say uh, two households have to work, right? Uh, life's expensive. And something I always remember, because we work with so many immigrants from all over the world, they're surprised when they come to America and say, it's really expensive here, right? I remember you when you first come here, you go, what, a soda cost that? A soda is really cheap in Syria and Jordan. It's, it's, it's different. So, so one of the really important things I think is this whole concept that you have to have not one job, but multiple jobs, right? And, and, I, and I think what I wanted, the question I want to ask the group, because we are working so hard, and, I, and you mentioned this, Jen, today, that your parents just didn't have the time to be involved with school. So if you can just share a, what's in, really important, how do you get around that, right? If you're an immigrant that's here and you're working really hard, you have children, but you, you, know, you need to be involved in their school, what, what are ways to get around that? Um, I, th I think one of the reasons that immigrant parents are not as involved with school um, is, first of all, that they... Um, Apart from the apart from the work and they're busy raising a family and working, um, I always felt that it wasn't um, a welcoming environment. You know, in those early years, we've changed that in Framingham under my leadership and Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was. Um, it, it, there, there was a sense for my parents 
coming to school meant what have I done wrong? What has my child done wrong? Uh, and the one time that my mother went to see my brother at the old Roosevelt School, we live in the Italian-American community still, um, but at Roosevelt School, it's, it's a park now, um, my mother saw my brother uh, in the corner because, it, because he wasn't able to communicate and he wasn't able, and I think that made such a deep impact on her that she said, I'm never going to go back to that school um, again. And I, and I think one, and I think that, you know, as um, educators or as parents, you know, we have a responsibility of making our schools um, welcoming to our immigrant families. And that uh, means, you know, reaching them and meeting them halfway. Yes, we are in America and we have a responsibility of um, learning um, about the American system. Um, however, we need to meet, especially with our newcomer families, we really need to meet them halfway. Um, and, um, and we've had lots of events at Brace or at the library because sometimes you know, you know, parents couldn't uh, travel to all the different schools that are mostly on the north side. Um, but I think, you know, um, I think we've gone, we've done leaps and bounds. Um, but I think that one of the reasons is that we need to uh, do a better job of welcoming families. Great. Thank you. And the ESL adult program is amazing, by the way, so of doing this, yes. Yeah. And I think the other thing that was very common to, to all your, and we're doing a reflection, uh, is this, this um, notion of support. That in your case, you had family here. Uh, Leanne, you had some family here. Uh, you had a community, and you had an agency that helped, right? That in the end, you have to have support, right? You can't do it on your own uh, in the US of A, that you need, whether it's family, whether it's a, a, a cultural community, where there is an agency that you really need uh, uh, everybody. You know, we, we always say it takes a village, but it is, it is true that it, in fact, takes a village to, to make the uh, immigrants successful. Because we were all immigrants. Unless you're a Native American, right, everybody came from somewhere else in, in this world. Um, we have 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Uh, Vamos a hacer preguntas, pueden hacer en portugués, en español, o inglés. But you're afraid me ESL, so we prefer it in English, but it's okay. You can do any language. But if you get stuck, you can, it's, it's fine. So preguntas, questions that you may have for, for these great people we have up here today, tonight. Yes, sir. What is the restaurant in Marlboro? <laughs> Lavaredas. Lavaredas. I go there all the time. Lavaredas. Uh huh. All right, so we got well, a food question. That's good. Yes. How does Jordan compare to the U.S. in terms of welcoming refugees? Is there something Jordan does better than the U.S. that we can learn from? I think nothing better than U.S. <laughs> Um, the life in Jordan, it's so hard because we are refugees over there and uh, the people who Jordan people uh, doesn't need the refugee work over there or go to school. Um, I, I remember uh, my friends, the kids, when they went to, to school, they went afternoon in the morning to the Jordan people, uh, kids, and afternoon to the refugee people. Other questions for our group? Oh, you're, all right, keep it coming. You're, it's. How does Framingham's ESL program rank against other area, uh, yeah, the, the Framingham School's ESL program rank against the rest of Massachusetts. Um, so I, I, th I think um, uh, Framingham is well known in the state 
for um, the for uh, working with linguistically diverse students, multilingual learners, not only through their ESL programs, but also because we are able to offer dual language programs and transitional bilingual programs. And so the state of Massachusetts many times has uh, used the Framingham um, the Framingham Department of Multilingual Education as sort of as a as a model for um, for other districts to be able to um, start you know programs um, for their um, for their uh, for their students for their English learners. Can I talk about yeah. Bilingual program? Yes. Go ahead. You. So. No, but yeah, as a parent, you can uh, you can talk about the bilingual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when my youngest son went to school, uh, the public schools in here they had the bilingual program. He uh, learned Portuguese first, but he could speak English uh, up like the American, because he was five when we came here, because we talked to him all the time in Portuguese at home. He went to the bilingual program that was great. My, my son today can speak and write in Portuguese and read because of that. This program doesn't exist anymore. So it is, it's giving parents options, right? So we are not a one program stop for our um, bilingual and multilingual parents. We in Framingham, there are options. So the transitional bilingual program is one of the options that as a parent, Eliani had. We also have English as a second language uh, programs that all students need to take classes. Uh, and in the last few years, uh, we have doubled the number of um, double the number of dual language programs. This gives opportunities to students who are from other countries to be in classes with American students who want to learn Spanish and Portuguese or Portuguese. Um, you know, in Framingham, there's uh, two language, um, dual language programs that we have. Um, and so this is a wonderful opportunity for um, students on both sides, both from other countries and for, you know, our American students to be able to learn, you know, from each other, about each other. Um, and, um, and this is amazing. Again, these are options for parents, right? And so it's no longer, well, this is it. And this is the only thing that, you know, this is the only way that you will learn, be able to learn English. You are able to be to learn English and keep your culture and learn, um, you know, how to speak, read, and write, you know, in either English or in Portuguese or in Spanish. Uh, if you look at Barbieri Public Schools, it's been in existence since 1990 as the dual language program and still going strong. And um, I was so very proud that we started the uh, dual language programs in Portuguese at Porter Road, at Harmony Grove. You know, and also a brophy, and I was there when your son came, right? I was there when your son came, and Norman was amazing and is amazing. Um, and so, so again, it's it's being inclusive and being accepting uh, of all um, cultures and traditions. And this is who we are. This is America. And you know, in the the, the as soon as we understand that. You know, all of us. Um, it is, you know, it is what's um, what's needed. Um, and when we came here, the first thing that my parents did, they went and signed up for ESL classes at Barbieri School. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some, a few more minutes for our one or more or two more questions. Y yes, sir. I was very interested in the uh, see in cultural. Uh, uh, which is a culture shock, you know, there's a term culture shock. So besides the language, there is a huge difference in values and other things. So 
I was just wondering if anyone wants to reflect on the culture aspects. Great question. The question is, uh, America has different cultures. Can you talk about what was that like when you come to America and there's different ways of doing different things? If anyone can, wants to comment. I think uh, nothing different. Uh, in, in, in our country, we have a Muslim, we have a Jewish, we have a everything. And uh, all the people love each other. Uh, here, uh, just a different, I told you, the people smile on your face all the time. In our country, when you rode in your way, all the people absent. And uh, I, I don't know why the people make a smile or uh, something in emoji in his face. But uh, here, everything, everything difficult. Difficult, uh, not difficult, different, and um, the people here love each other. But about the culture, nothing different. I mean, one thing I would say about culture shock, I, th I think um, parents and families try to keep the traditions and the culture of their countries and of their language and of their languages. There comes a point as children get older and they become more Americanized that you're living in two worlds, right? You can speak. You, you, they're living in two worlds. And so parents try to retain all of that culture that is part of who you, we are, right? But then as we are learning to live in this country, um, you become really, you know, I want to use the word Americanized, but, you know, you're open to different other um, cultures and different other languages. And I think there's a push and pull in the home. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. I'd like to speak for the library. Um, I hope you all know we have a literacy program here. Uh, that actually I wrote the grant for years ago. I'm a library trustee here, and I'm very proud that we are able to work with the History Center and all of you. Uh, we have a lot of students here. There's one right over here, and that's where it was. And if you want help with any language, uh, we, we are here to help you. Let us help, too. Great. Right. Well, I think we have one more question, and then I'm going to turn over to Anna to close it out for us. Hi, everyone. I'm also a library trustee, like Jen. I'm the vice um, chair on the library. And I'm also not from, I don't, didn't grow up here, but I came here when I came to go to college at UMass Amherst. The one barrier I didn't have was the, the language, the English language, because English is my first language in the Caribbean. But there is a culture shock, and the, the biggest one for me was the weather. <laughs> was the winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm still like trying to wear dresses when it's cold. And um, that was a, the hardest thing for me, honestly. I think I came here young enough where I was so naive that it was really easy to kind of learn the culture and everything else. But I'd like to share with you one of the things we're doing at the library. Um, I advocated for us to get some welcome signs at all the libraries in multi-language. So that's coming soon. We're not sure when. Um, we're going to try to put some inside and eventually get some permanent signs so everyone can see their language written like welcome on the outside of the library. So I just like to share that with you. And thanks for the program. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to our incredible speakers, to Lino as well, and all of you for being here tonight. Um, Thank you. I, I know that it's such a busy time and we have so much going on, but just taking a moment to think and reflect. And I hope some of the Lino's questions that he asked tonight, you can ask of yourself. You can ask of your family um, also when you go home as well. So um, again, can we give a round of applause to everyone up here tonight? It's, it's no small thing to get up and speak to a packed crowd here. And so I really want to thank all of you um, here. So on behalf of the Framingham History Center, these are the stories that we want to preserve, that we need to preserve, and that we want to share as well. And as I mentioned, we have an exhibition that's opening up in the fall. And 
your voices need to be a part of that exhibition, your stories, the experiences that you've had as well. Um, and we've also said we match tonight. So we're, we coordinated specifically for this. Um, and so as part of that, um, in the last few minutes after the formal program has ended, please share your story in the back. There's the map. There's the timeline that's so important. Um, there are the opportunities on a post-it note, just to write a few words down. Um, and at the Framingham History Center, we would love to see you. Um, we are out and about the community, but we welcome you and our doors are open at the Framingham History Center and you belong there. Um, and we really, really want to see you there tonight. Um, I'd also like to give a thank you to our incredible staff, volunteers, and board who are here. So if you don't mind raising your hand if you're part of that group. So Stacey and Christine, Susan, Leslie, who just spoke, Allie, Doug, <laughs> you know, Mauricio in the back. <laughs> so I just want to say we have an incredible team and we're so excited to get to know you and hear your stories more. And in the fall, please join us for an exhibition that you're creating with us. So thank you again and we look forward to seeing you more. Thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you.